right. Well, we're going to keep going on aldehydes and ketones today. It's going to continue on in very similar, very similar reactions. Most of these reactions are going to be nucleophilic additions, like we talked about. Um, so we're just going to add a wide swath of new of functional groups that can react and can act as nucleophiles. Um, so this will be a um, it'll be a volume heavy lecture, but the concepts are going to be nothing new compared to what we saw last last lecture. So we can go ahead and um, go ahead and get started there. I did not grade the quizzes yet, but I figured we could go through it. Um, just just right here at least for these for these questions, and I'll grade it and talk about specific questions. Um, later today. So a reminder that when we're doing, doing the aromatic reactions, um, we had really good three reactions of benzene rings that we classified as substitutions. Um, and they were the electrophilic aromatic substitution. That's when we spent the most time on, right? That's where we had ortho meta directors. We were making that, that um, sigma complex. Um, if it's a nucleophilic substitution, we're not replacing a hydrogen, we're replacing a good leaving group. And there were really only two options. So the second we can recognize it's nucleophilic substitution because of our reactants being nucleophilic, um, then we know, okay, it's going to be one of two things. It's either going to go through that benzyne intermediate where you have the elimination followed by the addition, or if you have a nitro group and a good leaving group and their para relative to each other, then you can have the nucleophilic aromatic substitution. And so that's what we have here. We have a good nucle a strong nucleophile. We have a nitro group, which is our most common electron withdrawing group. And it's in the para position to the bromine, which is our good leaving group. And it could be ortho or para, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but para is more common just due to sterics. Um, so we're, the mechanism for A is going to be that nucleophilic aromatic substitution. B, we've got, we don't have a strong nucleophile. We have a good leaving group. We have a bunch of electron withdrawing groups. Um, we have a Lewis acid, which is going to make the chlorine a good electrophile. So this is gonna be, if it reacts, would be electrophilic. And I didn't leave no reaction as an option. This is one where you have two moderately deactivating groups and a weakly deactivating group. That's right on the border of what we would consider to be a, a viable reaction. It would probably react, but slowly. C, once again, we have a strong nucleophile, or sorry, strong um, electron withdrawing group, we have a strong electrophile under the acidic conditions. And remember, acidic conditions almost always are going to favor electrophilic because your, your strong nucleophiles are usually pretty good bases as well. So if you're in acidic conditions, you're more likely than not going to see an electrophilic reaction happening. That's really your a, really quick way to tell the difference. Um, you can still, for some other functional groups, you can still have a nucleophilic step in there somewhere, but it's not going to be, you don't have strong nucleophiles if you're under acidic conditions. If you're going to have a nucleophilic attack, it's going to be something like water acting as a nucleophile, not hydroxide acting as a nucleophile. So we are under electrophilic conditions. So we're going to add a nitro group so electrophilic substitution for C. And given we don't have that many, that large variety, um, and so it's, you know, if you just learned to recognize, well, nitric acid in H2SO4, that's my nitration reaction. Therefore, it's electrophilic. That's also a valid way to do this when you don't have that many possibilities. Um, but the if you were approaching this and you didn't recognize that this was a specific mechanism just right off the bat, the way to approach this type of question would be to say, okay, well, 
I don't recognize the reaction, but I know it's electrophilic. And then you could work from there. Or in this case, that's all you needed to do um, was to decide the mechanism. So D is also electrophilic. E, we have a good leaving group. We're under very basic conditions. So nucleophilic conditions, we don't have a strong electron withdrawing group. So this is gonna go through that elimination addition. So you'll start by pulling a hydrogen off, chlorine leaves, you make that benzyne intermediate, which is where you have a triple bond. And it's gonna be on the two carbons. The, the carbon that has the leaving group has to be one of the two carbons for your benzyne intermediate. Um, so that's gonna limit what products you can get. And then one more time, we've got a good nitro group, para to a good leaving group, and we're under basic conditions. So nucleophilic conditions. So this is gonna be our nucleophilic aromatic substitution. I suppose I should fill these in and make sure I didn't make a typo in the uh, key anywhere. Aromatic. So, and when it comes to making this decision to, I, especially when you only have three choices and this is mostly test taking strategy, if one of your choices is very specific, like the nucleophilic addition has to meet all three criteria, that should be the easiest one to recognize out of the two nucleophilic ones, right? So as soon as you see it's nucleophilic and you have a nitro group, they, that's a pretty big key, but it also means it's easiest to eliminate that one too. So that's kind of the one that I would look at first because either you're gonna be able to eliminate it very quickly and then pick the third choice and move on, or you've got to check all three of those criteria anyway. So with that in mind, I. I find it easier, easiest to approach it from that perspective, especially in a time situation, which I recognize not often does OCHEM show up on standardized tests, but um, for the people in this room, you might see it on a standardized test. So, and it's just a good strategy in general for any standardized test. All right. And if you are considering going to a grad school other than med school and you take the standard GRE, the chemistry GRE is the hardest test I've ever taken. It's very satisfying to finish it, but it was a lot of hard work. The standard GRE, which is basically the SAT, it's got a verbal or it's got a written component and an English component and a math component. And the math is not hard math for science majors. That was one of the most satisfying tests I've ever taken because I just crushed it. And so, you know, that uh, knowing that I can write and do English better than most of the humanities majors who are going on to grad school in you know, English um, was very, very satisfying. Um, does that make me petty? Maybe. <laughs> How's the view up there, Sean? I, I, I like to do well. <laughs> Knowing that I'd spent so much time studying for the chemistry GRE to be able to walk into a regular GRE blind. I didn't even know public. there was like subject specific GREs. So did you have to take that to apply for, like for chemistry? For most of them, it was sort of one of those, it was like this the SAT twos where the subject oh, where you didn't yeah. have to do it, but for some departments they wanted you to. Yeah. And that one, that's the first time I've ever felt um, very satisfied. I think I got like a 78th percentile on the chemistry GRE, which Considering who's taking the GRE, I thought I felt pretty good about it. Yeah. From a very small school, because yeah. I was a little worried about that. Um, and then the GRE one, that the other GRE was. I so didn't, after after, after that one, I, yeah, it was a confidence. <laughs> um, so test taking strategy serves you well, and you've learned that in science majors. It's true. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> All right. Um, 
naming carbonyls. So nothing particularly tricky, right? It's just a matter of recognizing your functional group, remembering the suffix that goes with it, and then maybe doing some orange mass. So for A, it's a ketone. So this would be cyclopentanone would be the, the parent name. Um, and then you're going to have, we're assuming prior, or assigning priority here for the carbon circled in red. One, two, three. And four is already into the board. So this first one, one in red, carbon two, is going to be S. So it's going to be 2S. So much better. This one, I don't know what happened to that other one where the touch screen doesn't match up with where I touch on the screen here. It doesn't match with where it reads it. This is so much better to use. I'm still teaching on that other one. That's um, for the blue one. Our priority will go one, two, three, and then four is pointed towards us. And since for the rings, the ring structures are the, the easiest way to assign priority for that is if you've got one atom that is higher atomic number than anything else on that ring or attached to that ring, it's Basically, whichever direction around the ring gets to that one first. If it's all carbons, that makes it a little tricky because, you know, as soon as you have one chlorine or one oxygen or one nitrogen attached, it's just whichever direction around the ring gets there first. Um, and so you get there one carbon faster if you go upward. So that's counterclockwise, but we're looking at it backwards. So if we stepped through and looked this way, it would be clockwise, or we could take this and we could flip this over, and then we would have the hydrogen into the board, but two and three would be reversed. Um, and so we wind up with three R. Just since it's been a while since we practiced doing that. And but they, the main part of this is the cyclopentanone. And it's going to be two propyl three methyl. Do the full IU pack name for that one. And that's about as complicated as it can get, right? Is compound B has two functional groups. So I guess I shouldn't speak too, too soon. Um, but for, for these things we name with a suffix, if there are two suffixes we can use at the same time, like one suffix to indicate that's an alkene and another one to indicate that there's an aldehyde. So instead of being, this is normally butanal, if it doesn't have the double bond, so it's going to be butanal. And we would just... And it's one of those that you really have to enunciate, over enunciate, to make sure that you're making the point that that's an alkene, because most people are going to assume that it's an alkene um, if you're just speaking out loud to somebody. So one, two, three, four. So it's you teen, but then we would drop the e. And put the out there. So it's a little bit like an enol, where you have an alkene with an ol at the end, right? Um, the difference is this is easier in terms of numbering, because if it's an alkene and an alcohol, you have to say where both of them are. With an aldehyde, you already know that it's on carbon one by definition. It has to be on carbon one because it has to be at the end of the carbon chain. That means you only need to specify where the alkene bond is. So it would be on carbon two, between carbon two and three. So two butenal or butene aldehyde, um, if you're really being specific. And then it's going to be a three methyl. And you don't need to worry about E and C, right? Because we have two identical methyls attached to the alkyl. 
and compound C, if you recognize that it's a, if you can recognize a base molecule, a common name molecule that you could then just amend by adding prefixes, that's totally fine too. Um, so if you recognize that compound C is, is uh, acetone with six fluorines attached to it, you can, you can just name it hexafluoroacetone. In fact, that's probably the most common name for it. Um, and we don't need to specify where those six fluorines are because there's only six places to put a fluorine, right? So if there's only six places to put a fluorine, you know where they are. They have to be on carbon one and carbon three. Um, and same if you were using the IUPAC name, it would be propanol. And but we'd still throw the hexa fluoro. You don't really need the hyphen in there either necessarily since we're pretty good at recognizing those numeric prefixes. So I might put like two answers. Mm -hmm. But uh what you come up I with? think there's good rationale behind what I see. I did a uh, dye trichloromethyl ketone. And okay. uh, so if you do, if you are overly specific, you know, nobody's going to fault you for that. They might just look at you like you're doing extra work for no reason. Um, but no, yeah, especially that's the sort of thing that, so if you're, if you're publishing a paper, um, there's always, there's three reviewers. Reviewer number two is always the harder one who's, who's rough on everything. Reviewer three is always checked out. And reviewer one is, is a cheerleader. It just works out that way. Reviewer two would, would mark that up and make you take out the one, 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 three, three, three. Reviewer one and three wouldn't care. I mean, I was thinking that like, you know, from viewing this is like, for, for publishing, you'd be like, yeah, this is the one. In the lab, you're like, hey, can we that next fluoroacetone, please? Right, exactly. <laughs> and it's it's the sort of thing when reviewer two says that and like makes you go back. Reviewer one and three aren't going to tell reviewer two he's wrong. Like, but they're but they're like, you know, you're not wrong, Walter. You're just an asshole. That um, <laughs> it's that kind of, of level of pedantry. Um, <laughs> okay, and, I had the right answer initially. I I thought, oh, that looks like acetone. On it, um, but that's not going to be the the iron factory, and and uh, it's like the propanone would be the the iron factory, so hexafluoro propanone, and then I and then my brain just was like hepta, and I wrote hepta fluoro propanone, so the hexa, even though I knew it was hex. So, um, like that. And that that happens, and Brittany, I've never so. I didn't really even learn the the old school way of naming ketones until I taught this class. My my school had switched over to IUPAC names fairly early, but the so di tri fluoro methyl yeah. ketone. That's right. Yeah, so that works. If you have trifluoromethyl group on either side of a ketone, you could name it di trifluoromethyl ketone. It's not wrong. It's just the old school way of doing it, where you name each side of the ketone as though it was a branch. Um, and so it's less, just less common at this point. You mostly see that for um, for simple molecules that you are still able to find in things like hardware stores. Most textbooks have switched over to IUPAC for the most part. They'll still present this other way as like, hey, you should also know about this. Um, but it's uh, it's fairly uncommon these days, especially if it's a complicated branch. Um, it's something that's easily recognized, like the diisopropyl ketone is probably probably something that if you looked it up, you know, it's under that name somewhere. Um, but anything more complicated than an isopropyl group, and you're going to have you're going to use the IUPAC name. 
And these ones were interesting. So, and just because there is a, um, this is the way that multiple choice questions are typically written for OCHEM. It's typically written something like, okay, here's a reaction. Which of these is the right product? So you can use process of elimination and you can use that same technique when you're answering questions, even if it's open-ended, as long as you can say, okay, well, I know there's a couple main options. What can I cancel out? Process of elimination is still immensely powerful, even on a, on a blank piece of paper style test. Once you can eliminate what you know is wrong, then that lets you focus on, well, it's gotta be one of these other options and that increases your odds of getting it right. So bromine being added in this case, we have, so that's a going to be a nucleophile, sorry, electrophile, um, which means we have to look at both of these benzene rings and decide which one is going to add to and where. And so this is one, I like this question a lot because it makes you think about, okay, well, which of these is the first spot it's going to add and why? Um, because if we look at the left-hand ring, that has an electron withdrawing group on it, right? Which means if it added on that side, it would add in the, um, it would add in the meta position. So one of these two positions. But our other option is an electron donating group. And so which of those is the is activating and which is deactivating? We know that that determines ortho versus para, or ortho and para versus meta, but on top of which directing does it? Does it add which of them, which of those two benzene rings is going to be more active, more reactive? Yeah, so the one not on the carbonyl side, um, the right hand phenyl group, because you have the lone pairs, because it's electron donating, and this is an electrophilic reaction, you have more electron density on the right hand side, which means that's the more activated. Remember, that's what it came down to is when you had lone pairs conjugated to the benzene ring, you were activating it. When you had um, double bonds conjugated to the benzene ring, you were deactivating it. And so beyond just meta versus OP, that allows us to decide which side is more reactive. And so our options really are limited to it's either going to be A or C. And so then it just becomes a matter of sterics. There are two options that would give us um, A, but that's a pretty big bulky group taking up space, right? An ester with a bent ring on the other side of it. So our most likely product is going to be C. We'll have a mixture of A and C, but probably mostly C and maybe trace amounts of B and B. Maybe you can detect them. It probably is going to be in the like, one molecule out of every 100,000 range as far as the difference in yields. And I think that was all of them, right? Any specific questions about, about these problems or about the... Um, Carbonyls. Can you say that one more time? What you were saying. Um, so the electron uh, donating group is um, activating, and then the electron withdrawing group is deactivating. Um, so what were you saying about it happening with uh, from? So. So in this case, as far as this, you mean the sterics or or just which deciding which benzene ring to use? Um, it was it was something about bromine being something. Bromine is an electrophile. Oh, okay. 
in, a, in which is the OCHEM way of phrasing, bromine is a oxidizing agent. In other words, bromine is electron deficient. Oxidizing agents and electrophilic are both two ways of saying bromine wants electrons. Okay. Yeah. And so the fact that bromine is our reactant means we're going to that electrophilic um, mechanism. And I always just, I think it's uh, was worth going through that so that we can review that chart. Where does that? Let's go start. That's not what I want. Um, of uh, that that ranks. The, all of the different substituents in terms of are they electron donating or electron withdrawing. That chart right there. So this chart has all of the most important details for activators and deactivators and whether they're OP directors or meta directors. Um, but it, I think it's worth coming back to the fact that this all comes down to are they electron donating or withdrawing? Because having lone pairs conjugated with the benzene ring means you're going to stabilize that intermediate, which makes them ortho pair directors. Having um, pi bonds or extremely electronegative elements like the halogens attached means you're going to be electron withdrawing and make them less reactive and also meta directors and the halogens are just in that weird in between where they're weakly deactivating but they still stabilize the sigma complex enough that they're OP directors but other than the halogens um it's uh, it's pretty easy to to differentiate between lone pairs means OP I bonds means meta and then you know, not to burden you too much with the way my brain works, because that's not always helpful. Um, but I just always remember that the halogens are the weird ones in the middle. And then I have to go through the logic in my head every time about which goes which way. Um, but I find it easier to remember that that's the exceptions. And then I have this general rule for everything else. All right, let's do a little bit of review of, of the simplest nucleophilic addition reactions. Um, and so the reminder that these, if it's a nucleophilic addition, the other addition reactions we've seen have been electrophilic additions where we've got a pi bond between two carbons equally spaced out. Um, if it's a nucleophilic addition, that means you've got a pi bond where you've got a difference in electronegativity between the two sides of the pi bond, and that gives you the partial positive. And in this case, if we're under acidic conditions, the first thing you, you do is you protonate a lone pair. So instead of being acid catalyzed for, for electrophilic addition, acid catalyzed meant the first thing you did was break the pi bonds. But in this case, we have a lone pair we can protonate instead without breaking a pi bond. So we protonate a lone pair first, which gives a nucleophile, even if it's a weak nucleophile, can come in and attack that partial positive and wind up making our tetrahedral carbon as a product. If it was under basic conditions, again, the order just flips. It gives you a stronger nucleophile and less protons around. The first thing is you protonate the partial positive, or sorry, you um, attack the partial positive with the nucleophile, which breaks the pi bond, and then you protonate the resulting oxygen. And we did these to end class on Thursday. But since it's such a simple mechanism, we can go back through these. Just a reminder that the order of the steps is dependent on is it acidic or basic. 
So looking at the conditions and determining acidic and basic. And if you've got a strong nucleophile, like a Grignard reagent, that's a pretty good indication that you're under, a, under basic conditions. If you've got a weaker nucleophile or something that's explicitly acidic, like HCl, then you're under acidic conditions. So if we drawing this out, the first step here would be that the ethyl group takes its electrons from magnesium, so it backs the cyclohexanone. And you have to make room for it so we don't get a carbon with five bonds. So for reaction A, your intermediate then looks like I'm just gonna reposition everything so that it's look like this. And then step two is you add water to it, partly to use up the leftover Grignard reagent and partly as a proton source, mostly as a proton source. And again, that could be anything, for instance, a methyl or a methanol or ethanol are also common proton sources here. And if we were drawing the mechanism for B, it would look just like the mechanism on the previous slide. First thing is lone pair grabs that hydrogen, and then the chloride acts as a nucleophile. So your intermediate for B look like this. And that would be your second step. And so I know we spent a lot of time on that last week on Thursday, but it's worth remembering because that's going to be the basis for all of these other reactions we're going to do today. It's just what is your nucleophile? And what we're going to see is there's numerous reactions where this happens twice in a row, which means you can wind up with effectively do an addition reaction once and then you follow it up with an element with a substitution reaction, which takes you to something that looks completely different than what you started from, but it goes through the same basic process. So let's try a practice. If water is your nucleophile on a, especially on a um, aldehyde, the result is a hydration reaction but it's a nucleophilic hydration and it gives you a diol. So you go from a carbonyl to a diol. So what would that reaction look like? Try drawing it out. But it's a weak nucleophile. Right. So, yes, yeah, te technically, um, but because we're talking about the catalyzed conditions, drawing the mechanism, you would not need to specify, but you don't need to specify whether it's acidic conditions or basic conditions just to write the reaction. So, if we start from acetone, regardless of acidic or basic, conditions, the product is going to look the same. And then typically, if we're trying to indicate using one mechanism over another, when we're writing this reaction, it's the acidic conditions, we would just write, you know, put H plus as a catalyst there. So it needs to be acidic conditions, but it doesn't really matter what the acid is. You just want to pick something that's not a better, where the conjugate base is not a better nucleophile. 
than water is. So sulfuric acid gets most common, it's probably most commonly used in OCHEM, use uh, sulfuric acid because hydrogen sulfate is a really bad nucleophile. Uh, so if you want water to be your reactant, that's a, a pretty good way to do it. And the mechanism would just start with If it's, if it's acid catalyzed, then you start with either, you know, yes, that's, that's not right. So you would start by having your oxygen lone pair get protonated, and then the water could come in. And in step two, your water is going to come in and act as a nucleophile to break that pi bond. And then in this case, if we have water acting as nucleophile, but we don't wind up with a protonated alcohol at the end, the next step would be you would get one extra deprotonation at the end because you wind up with an intermediate that looked like. that, so you need something that could act as a base to just to deprotonate that oxygen. One more step. That's nothing, nothing we haven't seen a dozen times in other reactions. And it doesn't even really matter what you make base, you wanna just use some generic base B with a lone pair, you can draw like that as well. Because water could be the base, the hydrogen sulfate could be the base, whatever else happens to be around that has a lone pair could be a base. But the most correct way to make it so that your catalyst totally balanced out is you want to use the conjugate base of your acid catalyst. You want to you want to use that as your base at the end, so that you regenerate the same acid that you started with. That's that. All right. So if instead of having Water as so if we if we do use water as our nucleophile, we get a hydration reaction that gives us a diol. If you use an alcohol as your nucleophile, you wind up making that functional group that I mentioned last week um, called a hemiacetal. And a hemiacetal is just when you've got a so the the reason it's, it's its own specific functional group, it's not considered an alcohol and also an ether, even though that's really what it is. Um, because the oxidation state of the carbonyl carbon didn't change. You started with two carbon oxygen bonds and you still have two carbon oxygen bonds. And so that puts this in sort of a unique position. It's not an alcohol and also an ether. Um, because that could be on two different carbons. If it's alcohol and ether on the same carbon that has the unique property of the oxidation state didn't change, which means these are fairly reversible reactions. They happen pretty easily and they happen in both directions pretty easily because it's not a redox reaction. It's pretty simple to convert back and forth between carbonyl, hemiacetal, or acetal. So a hemiacetal is when this has happened once, when you've broken the carbonyl pi bond and you and attached an alcohol to it. So you have an ether, and then you still have the same oxygen, which is protonated now. If you take that molecule and have it go through a substitution reaction, then you get the acetal. And again, just like when we first learned substitution reactions, we learned that they're mostly reversible, especially if your leaving group 
is not a great leaving group or and you have a weak nucleophile like we would have here, um, you're going to wind up with the reaction happening in both directions. And so you wind up with this converting a carbonyl to an acetal or a hemiacetal is a pretty um, reversible reaction. You just control it using Le Chatelier. Um, and in general, you, you're going to wind up with equilibrium favoring the carbonyl compounds, except for aldehydes, especially the smallest aldehydes. Right, because the more electron density you can donate here, then if you donate a lot of electron density here, then it's not a very good target for a, for a nucleophile. And so that slows down and really slowing down is the wrong way. It makes it less favorable for a weak nucleophile to come in and add there. So aldehydes are more reactive. Um, the formaldehyde is so reactive that you see it more in the acetal or hemiacetal form than in the um, aldehyde form. And so the mechanism for this whole thing is basically just putting together the mechanism we just talked about for acetone, and then you just do it again with the substitution reaction. So you start by, that's the, that's the reaction we just did. Proton transfer, weak nucleophile attacks. It's just using an alcohol as your weak nucleophile instead of a water. And then you deprotonate that alcohol and you make the hemiacetal. Once you make the hemiacetal, the next steps, it's really similar to an SN1 reaction. But the difference is that because we have an oxygen attached that has a lone pair, instead of making a carbocation intermediate, you wind up making this this intermediate down here. So after your leaving group leaves, you start by protonating your oxygen, make it a better leaving group. Water leaves. This arrow right here is the only thing that changes, separates it from an SN1 reaction. Because you've got lone, a lone pair right next to your leaving group, when your leaving group leaves, instead of having a carbon without a full valence, you just donate that pair of electrons and you wind up making an oxygen with a positive charge, but at least everything has a full valence. So you just wind up making this temporary intermediate that looks, that looks kind of like, well, it is a carbonyl-ish thing. It's not a common carbonyl. Um, and then from there, now your nucleophile can, can come in and attack. So it's a two-step substitution, just like SN1, we just don't get a carbocation intermediate because we make this pi bond instead temporarily. And then we have one more proton transfer at the end to just to deprotonate that. Right, so it's a lot of steps but none of them are that different. The first ones are the same mechanism we've been talking about. It's this nucleophilic addition reaction. The second steps are getting into the second steps is very similar. And in fact, actually, if you think about this as being a, as acting like a protonated. Um, carbonyl, it's the same as the steps up here, nucleophilic attack followed by proton transfer. It's just you have an R group attached to the oxygen instead of a hydrogen attached to the oxygen once you get here. So let's practice drawing this. So if you start with a ketone in acidic conditions with excess methanol, methanol is going to be your nucleophile. H2SO4 is just your catalytic hydrogen. So go through all those steps. 
just like that mechanism on the last page. And given the timing, we'll just tie this into break. So take five minutes to do the do A, and take a 10 minute break. So whenever you're done, do that. And when we come back, I'll have the mechanism written out. And we'll go through it and then talk about the second one. So proton transfer, nuclear field that proton transfer to get halfway. And then proton transfer to make your OH better leaving group. So these are the two extra steps. If you proton protonate your, your resulting oxygen to make it a better leaving group, and then it leaves and you make that weird carbonyl-ish thing, which probably has a technical name, but I don't know it off the top of my head. And then it's the same as your as breaking up the carbonyl from up above. Right, so everybody write down the reaction for A real quick, and then I'll go back to the mechanism and you can. Peruse that at your leisure. 
Let's 
know if anybody is with uh, here to know what salts. Yeah. There's not really any reason to do that, though, right? Because they're not the product that anybody's really interested in. Yeah, so a lot of those compounds, but they do still. So, oh, okay, reducing. So, it's, so that's sort of in the CBD sort of realm of. Yeah, and there we are. Yeah, was it was the THC carboxylated? Or, sorry, yeah, okay. Enough in conjunction with CBD. Yeah. Right. Because CBD has much more psychoactive effects as long as there's any amount of THC around. There's. Okay. Uh, I remember there was a process we were looking at for making a salt of THCA with dicyclohexamine. Okay. Which was based on the patent. The idea was to was that this uh, this compound or the salt was like insoluble, so rarely crystallizes. So they use more salt of other crystals. The company was working for attempting to order something for next cycle. How to tell the DEA that you're doing things you're not supposed to without telling the DEA? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't think there's any evidence. Like, <laughs> the synthesis of the DEA is definitely outside of the legal restriction. Right. It's all a gray area right now because there's some amount of processing that's allowed, but some of it's regulated and federally it's all illegal. But, but not, you know, there, there are some, uh, uh, so like, I don't know if you explore what's uh, like the CBD. It's like acid, acid, you know, Okay. Isomerization yeah. it produces delta eight caves. Okay. Uh, no. So 
that's sort of the right where they're like which probably makes sense given how little research there is on most synthetic yeah. synthetic drugs in general as long as they let us research and see what actually happens otherwise you just get research chemicals exactly. okay well not not delta a how about delta one how about you know that's it's a raven. This is the, there's a town in Washington that we stay in when we go up to Washington that has, I don't know what, why, what the backstory is, but they have ravens on the, all of their tourist town merchandise. Um, the way that we have the lake, they have ravens for some reason. Um, and I don't know why, but I watch really the Halloween ravens in general so why not have a raven mug and this time i was testing uh delta oh yeah but it was uh you know there, there's a lot of raven imagery there it's like interesting the person who's uh also staying that has like an old bookshelf and it's a raven oriented book or something that's like uh, indigenous art that's My brother still lives, my brother lives up there, so I'll have to ask. He is not the type that probably pays attention to anything like that. He might know. I'm not super into ravens, but every time I hear fun facts about ravens, I'm like, wow, those are really intelligent birds. Um, like the I heard that they display like funeral behavior when they see like one of their dead, they will like call other ravens and they'll all like be in the trees mm -hmm. and like realize that. It's dead and kind of like have a gathering. Well, yeah. Or the they they also and I think this is this applies to crows. It was first notice in crows, which is why it's called a murder of crows. Um, they will put each other on trial um, if one of them has wronged the group somehow, um, and then if if they're found guilty. So it basically, looks like one raven in the middle of a circle of of or a crow, one crow in the middle of a circle of crows. And sometimes they let that crow go, and sometimes they kill that crow. Um, and nobody knows exactly how they reached that decision, but that's where a murder of crows comes from, is the fact that they have some sort of like social regulation. It's, it's thought, anyway. That's what that's related to, that it's not just some you know, random, it's time for you to die moment. Um, <laughs> Your time is up. Right? Yeah, they're, they're fascinating. And then, like, people, I've just seen, like, people, like, talking to the crows and, like, forming, like, relationships with them where they bring the crows, like, fruits and nuts, and the crow will bring them, like, weird little trinkets that they find, like, charm bracelets and uh, points, you know. Wow, that's cool. In the, in the realm of, of very petty things that you can do to train birds, um, there was a professor who really didn't get along with the dean at a, at a research school, and um, trained all of the birds around to um, hang out on the tree right above the dean's parking spot um, <laughs> to the point where the dean's car was always covered in bird crap. How do you even do that? Like, they're very really smart. Yeah. You just condition. positively read. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, they're on that tree. Special. Yeah, all summer. We spent all summer when the dean was gone spreading bird seed right there. Oh, and my God. Didn't have to when everybody came back. Because the birds were used to hanging out right there. Brilliant. All right. Let's go through this mechanism for A here. Um, so the first step is still going to be the same. First step is you protonate the carbonyl and you make it so that you've got that good target for a nucleophile. So that mechanism would look like. You know, grabbing a proton, make an intermediate that's going to look like this. And then whatever your nucleophile happens to be, in this case, methanol, can come in and attack and attach 
to the carbonyl carbon. You just have to make room by moving the, the electrons over. And then go through one more proton transfer. So your first hemi or your second hemiacetal intermediate. Just gonna look like this, and then you just need something that can act as a base to take that hydrogen. So probably hydrogen sulfate. And that gets you to the hemiacetal. Right, so that's the same mechanism we've been seeing. I'm going to erase this now and work back the other way to get to the product, give myself some room here. So the key for the next step is you start by, by protonating the water to make it a good leaving group. So we just deprotonated The methanol, but now we can protonate the water. So that gives us a hemiacetal with a really good leaving group. Second step here is the one where it gets a little bit weird because your leaving group leaves as we would expect, but then your your ether that you have still attached has a pair of lone, a lone pair that can move down and form um, an I bond. So it's just like in in the sigma complex where we had lone pairs conjugated with benzene ring. We got an extra resonance structure right because of those lone pairs that could make it um, a pi bond. So we wind up with this intermediate then. Which just like a protonated ketone gives us a carbonyl carbon with that's a really good target for a nucleophile. So that we have excess methanol, or at least two equivalents of methanol. Methanol is our other um, nucleophile around. So we just undo the formation of that pi bond we just made and attach our second methanol to the same spot. Then we wind up with, we have one methanol that's still protonated. And one methanol that's no longer protonated. So we just have one more, one more proton transfer step to get to our product where we have two methoxies attached to the same carbon. And so and again, HSO4 with a minus, it's going to act as our base in this case. Oxygen keeps the electrons. And yours could probably look a lot neater than mine because you're up working on a whole piece of paper and you don't need to make it big enough for everybody to read um, from across the room. But even if yours looked as messy as this, that's still okay, as long as I can follow the logic. 
of what you're trying to show and you have all the arrows drawn. And so this the intermediate down here, when we're halfway through, that's our hemiacetal. Hemi means half, like hemisphere, right? And this final product up here, that's our um, acetal product. So the hemiacetal is just halfway there. So when it comes to remembering how to draw this mechanism, I would remember it in two steps. Remember the steps to get to the acetal formation and then, or sorry, the hemiacetal. And then you just have to, you just have to remember those two extra steps to get here. And now you're most of the way to the acetal formation to protonate the, the leaving group and then form that carbonyl-ish thing. So for our C, I'm not gonna go through the whole mechanism with all of the arrows, but I'll, let's draw the intermediate, the main intermediates for C so we can see what's going on. So the, the acetal that you get from C, it's gonna start by, you've got your OH group and then you've got your diol is attached at one of those oxygens from your diol is attached to your what was your carbonyl carbon. So that's our hemiacetal formation. And in this case, because you have two di or you have a diol, um, you can you're just going to have this second alcohol is going to be your nucleophile for the hemiacetal or for the acetal formation. So you're going to wind up with this same molecule being attached twice. So essentially the net result is going to be this one leaves and this comes in and attaches. So your acetal formation or your acetal is going to look like that. Like um, just a Separate. Not too much. You still are going to be able to use excess night because you've got the, the benefit instead of having two different dial molecules attaching and getting this twice. That's not going to be very common because one, that's a big steric group, and two, you already have your nucleophile like guaranteed to be a certain distance away. So just due to proximity, that's going to increase. In terms of rates, we can think of that as increasing the effective concentration of that second one because it's already right there. Um, so not typically, it's favorable for it to form this rather than having two big groups attached at the same time. This one winds up being significant, one, because of, of the, the rate of formation, but two, because this both of these are reversible reactions. This is actually a way that we can prevent an, a carbonyl from reacting. So this is what's known as a protecting group. Um, if we were doing a synthesis where we wanted one reactive group to, to react, but not your ketone over here, you can make your ketone and turn it into an acetal, which is more stable and then have your second group react be reduced to whatever's going on and then turn it back to being your ketone later just by controlling the, the using Le Chatelier's principle basically. And so basically we, the only way we need to control which side of this equilibrium is favored is by concentrations. Um, even entropy doesn't technically change that much between these two steps because you start with two free molecules and then, but then you make a water molecule when you go through this process. So you end with two free molecules as well. 
And that's probably, that's another thermodynamic reason why you don't get two different molecules attaching to the same spot is because then you'd be taking three molecules and turning it into two free molecules as opposed to two molecules becomes two molecules. So you've got entropy in favor of, of making them ring structure as well. So all you really have to do to switch it back is just add water with a little bit of acid to catalyze the reaction. You remove water in step one, add water in step two, and you're back and forth. And ethers aren't as reactive as carbonyls. And so that's the key um, that, for, that allows us to prevent the oxidation or reduction of carbonyl carbons is basically make them not a carbonyl carbon for a little bit and then turn them back to being a carbonyl carbon later. And that's, that's the gist of pretty much all protecting groups. There's a variety of different ways you can use protecting groups for different functional groups, but it's basically always take something that you don't want it to react, turn it into something less reactive, do your reaction, and then come back and convert back to the other functional group later. And so here's an example. If we have a ketone and an ester attached to the same molecule, and we want to reduce the ester, but not the ketone. Well, if we just threw lithium aluminum hydride in there, we could reduce the ester, but we would also reduce the ketone. If we don't want to do that, we take the ketone and we turn it to the acetal form first. And so you make an intermediate that would look like you make this intermediate in step one. Now that's not a carbonyl carbon means it doesn't get reduced. Lithium aluminum hydride is a strong reducing agent, but it can't reduce an alcohol or an ether. So you turn it to an ether first, then put lithium aluminum hydride in, which reduces this group. So your second intermediate then would look like look like this and then you just add a little bit of acid and some water and it converts your acetal back to being a ketone and so it seems like it's a fairly specific case where we're trying to protect a, car, a ketone or an aldehyde but this concept shows up in organic synthesis a lot. So there's a lot of times where you want two different functional groups on the same molecule, but you don't want them both to react equally. All right, so a couple of other versions that go through the same exact reaction pathway but with a nitrogen-based nucleophile. If you do this through a nitrogen-based nucleophile, you wind up making something that's just like an, a hemiacetal, except with a nitrogen attached instead of with an oxygen attached. So instead of getting an ether, you get a, a secondary amine. Um, and so those are called carbonolamines, a well for the alcohol and then amine because you have a nitrogen attached. Um, but then they will go through a second step as well. Um, except the second step is not another molecule attaching. It's basically the fact that the nitrogen can make um, two bonds. You, you, the net result is that you wind up replacing your carbonyl oxygen with a carbon double bonded to a nitrogen. Uh, and so then you make this functional group called an imine. 
maybe I mean, I don't know. I read it. I don't watch videos typically. I've always heard it called an I mine. Other people might pronounce that M I N E be more like an amine. It's an I mean, maybe. I've heard M E. Okay. So we have three pronunciations now. Um, I will um, try to stick to I mean, but I'll probably say I might just out of habit. Same net reaction, except that, or the same mechanism, except that we basically stop at that weird R group attached to an oxygen. That was a, a weird intermediate on our way to making the acetal, right? Here, it's basically where it stops because that nitrogen doesn't have a positive charge. It can be relatively stable like that. And so it just stops at the I mean. And so consider, think about that structure. And then if I jump backwards, this structure right here, just like the I mean, except with the nitrogen instead of an oxygen. Um, and those are relatively stable. They do have some biochemical properties that are that are useful in synthesis um, or in, in pharmaceuticals. Um, it's also just another another form of these that can be useful for, um, for instance, if you wanted to make something that's stored with a higher melting point. If you if you Thought your molecule was an aldehyde, but you wanted to store it and not have a lot of aldehyde vapors or have it um, be as reactive, you could convert that to an imine. And an imine is going to have a higher molecular weight and therefore it's going to have a higher melting point. And so sometimes you just wind up doing these conversions or these, these reactions um, for practical purposes when it comes to storage or taking a melting point. You know, for instance, benzaldehyde doesn't have necessarily a nice, crisp, clean melting point, um, and it's a liquid at room temperature. So rather than having to get it super cold, bring it up to temperature to measure melting point, you could just take that product, turn it into the imine, melt, measure the melting point of the imine, and say, okay, well, the melting point of the benzaldehyde imine that I made is this, which is what I expected. So it's um, it's in organic qualitative analysis is one way of confirming that you have what you think you have by making what's called a derivative. Okay, if it's this product, I'm going to confirm it's this product by converting it to this other molecule and taking the melting point of that. And then you have sort of three different pieces of information. You've got your original melting point, the fact that it went through this reaction, and now you make something that has another expected melting point gives you additional confirmation from back, especially back um, before they had um, easy access to NMRs and IRs where you couldn't necessarily confirm just by looking at an NMR or a mass spec or something. And so our mechanism, again, very similar. Nucleophilic attack, you start by making our it's analogous to a hemiacetal, but with a nitrogen. And then you go through the same steps once you get to the hemi hemiacetal version um, or analog. Then you can take that, protonate your oxygen to make it a better leaving group again. Leaving group leaves, and you make this nitrogen carbon double bond down here. You just have one extra hydrogen you need to remove. And so you just stop once you've done that proton transfer, as opposed to continuing on to have a second nucleophile attack. So this only works though if our amine is a is either ammonia, if it's just NH3, this works. Um, or if it's a primary amine meaning you only have one R group attached to the nitrogen. If it's a secondary amine, then once you get to this point right here, you don't have a good leaving group. 
And that's when you can wind up with other things happening. It's still going to be based around the same process, but from a practical standpoint, um, it winds up that this, re this reaction specifically only stops at the I mean if it's a primary amine or ammonia, although that's less common. It wouldn't be very common to you to use ammonia in this case, because then you just wind up with the nitrogen. We didn't really increase our molecular weight at all. And, and we did, so we didn't really make anything that um, has any practical use as much. Um, the interesting thing about this mechanism though, is that we need nitrogen to act as a nucleophile, but nitrogens with a lone pair are also good bases. So we need this to be acidic so that we can have proton transfers happening. There's two different places where we need to protonate something, right? But we can't have it too acidic because if we protonate our original nucleophile, then nothing happens. So this is a kind of a, a interesting mechanism in that it's got a sweet spot pH. You need it to be acidic, but not too acidic. Um, if you look at the rate of this reaction versus pH, if you get it much above a pH of five, the rate drops off because you don't have enough hydrogen, enough protons around to go through the proton transfer steps. But if you get your pH below three, you, then you wind up protonating your, your nucleophile too much. Your nucleophile is already going to be protonated for the most part, but it's, it's an equilibrium reaction, right? So there's some amount of your amine that's, that's still um, deprotonated until you get down to really acidic pHs, in which case, you know, you've got one out of every 100 million amine molecules um, that's deprotonated. That's really gonna slow your reaction down. It'll still technically progress, but it would be so slow you wouldn't be able to measure it. So this is one of the few cases where we have something, we have both um, acidic reactants and basic reactants in the same mechanism. Typically we have one or the other. If we're under basic conditions, everything's a base. If we're under acidic conditions, everything's in the acid form. But this reaction, we need both. If you try to do this reaction with a secondary amine, meaning you have two R groups attached to your nitrogen nucleophile, you still get to the carbonyl amine the same way. So remember the carbonyl amine is the nitrogen equivalent of the hemiacetal. So if you stopped at the hemi, the nitrogen hemiacetal version here, you would have OH, and you'd have your nitrogen attached, and your nitrogen has two R groups attached as well. And so if we were going to predict what happened, what would happen if we remove the, um, the oxygen the same way as before, we still would wind up making a weird intermediate that looks kind of like the I mean. But now we get a nitrogen with four bonds. Once we do that, we don't have a good leaving group attached to the nitrogen anymore. So I'm going to skip backwards for a second, then I'll come back. Basically, once you get to this point, you get stuck because you can't take on R group off of the nitrogen as easily as you can deprotonate it. So what happens instead is once you get here, Basically, you need a base reaction happening. You're going to go through an elimination. It's kind of like those that enol keto tautomerization, which, if you remember, was when if you had an enol where you had a double bond attached to an OH group, that could go through a, an equilibrium reaction that converted it to look like this, right? You switch the pi bond over. 
basically had a simultaneous elimination and, and addition happening. We can do something similar here, except in reverse, we're going to make the carbon carbon pi bond in order to free up a pair of electrons for the nitrogen. So basically, one of the hydrogens down here is going to the pi electrons from the carbon nitrogen bond are going to snag a next door hydrogen. And that frees up these electrons to move over and make a pi bond. So the net result winds up being this molecule. Is that the nitrogen still only has three bonds, so the nitrogen still got its long pair and it's stable. All the carbons still have full valences. So instead of making the imine, you make an enamine, which sounds weird, but it's just like an enol. An enol was when you had an alkene with an alcohol next to it, right? Enamine is when you have an alkene with a nitrogen attached. Yeah. So an, an enol just written like that. So replace the OL. So it's the same way we name amines. We haven't learned naming amines yet. You name an amine the same way you name an alcohol, except instead of the same OL, you say amine. So instead of an enol, we have enamine. Right, and so that's what the rest of this mechanism looks like. You start by making the carbonolamine, just like before with the imine, and you make the same intermediate. It's a weird something on the screen here. So we'll This probably me that got us stuck there in the first place. <laughs> yeah. So we still make that same intermediate as the I mean, but instead of just deprotonating it and being done, because we can't deprotonate it, we just go through a proton transfer. Effectively, we go through a, an elimination step to move the, the pi electrons around. And I think I showed the pi electrons grabbing that hydrogen, but that didn't add up to the right balanced reaction. So it's really just that the nitrogen steals those pi electrons back to turn them into a lone pair. And the carbon, the alpha carbon, the carbon next door, loses the hydrogen to become an alkene. So all of the mechanisms that we've talked about today, it's really the same mechanism, but just a subtle tweak. We can't quite say it's just as easy as substitution because substitution was literally the same mechanism for everything. Each of these are almost the same with a little tweak. Right? You make, first you turn your carbonyl into a tetrahedral carbon, and then you, then you go through a substitution, make the acetal, or you go through um, this intermediate. The intermediate looks like this to make the imine or the enamine. So subtle differences, very small changes at the very end to determine the differences there. So let's practice. So quick recap, I guess I'll go to a blank, blank page first. So carbonyl 
plus alcohol. You make the acetal. Carbonyl plus a primary amine. Or, yeah, primary amine. And you make the imine. And all of these R groups don't have to be identical. They could all be any R group, including a hydrogen. And if you did the same thing with a secondary mean, Can't get my eraser. And then figuring out which direction the pi bond goes for the enamine, it follows alkene stability rules. So more substituted is more favorable. So your major product will be whichever. If these two R groups aren't identical, then you're going to either get a 50 50 mixture if they're equally substituted, or if one of the R groups is more substituted, then you're preferentially going to put the double bond that direction. So acetal, I mean, enamine. And I suppose if, if you're if you're just using water, then you make the dial would be the other version, right? So same mechanism, subtle tweaks here and there. The difference to tell, like for the nitrogen reactant in the IV versus the amine, like you said, primary versus secondary. So if you have two hydrogens in one R group, then you have two good leaving groups on that nitrogen. So basically, the, the imine is more favored, but you can't make the imine if there are two R groups on your nitrogen because you don't have two good leaving groups on your nitrogen. So you make the imine-ish thing that has two R groups, and then instead of deprotonating it, because there is no proton to take away, you steal a proton from a carbon next door and make the alkene instead. So it's, it really is still a proton transfer step. It's just, you can't steal a proton from this nitrogen because it doesn't have one. So you steal a proton from something next door. So what do we get? For this first one. First off, what is our nucleophile? The oxygen is going to take electrons away. The nucleophile that's going to attack the carbonyl carbon, though, is this nitrogen. We're going to go through something that involves nitrogen being attached there. And because that's a secondary nitrogen, so our intermediate would look something like so our do both intermediates, our carbonolamine. Intermediate is going to look like it's a good practice for drawing a 
heptagon. So our carbonolamine would look like that. We don't have another proton that we can lose, so it won't make the imine. It's going to make the enamine. When it goes to the next step, so the, the second intermediate we would get is the OH leaves as water. We wind up with a nitrogen with four bonds temporarily. So that's not very stable. It's not that bad. Drawn more septagons. So then that this would be our second one. And so because we can't just take a proton to make the imine, we're going to take a hydrogen from next door. So our final product is. This first intermediate center of the room. And if you really want to test your, your freehand polygon drawing skills, try drawing a regular hexagon. Octagons, hexagons, pentagons, those are easy. Heptagons. Heptagons and nonagons are the trickiest ones. And so because we started with a secondary amine, in other words, an amine that has two carbons attached to it, we can't make the imine. I mean, so we have to make the enamine instead. If it looks very similar, but the nitrogen is not part of the ring, but attached to the ring, that's a primary amine. So this one can make the imine. So this product. And remember that the imines essentially look like you replaced your oxygen and your carbonyl with the nitrogen. It's a carbon double bonded to a nitrogen that just also has an R group attached because it's a primary nitrogen or primary amine. You can do that. Or this one in the top right, excess alcohol, means we make the acetal, which means we're going to replace that carbonyl with two ethers. And whatever your R group is on your alcohol is what's going to be your R group on your ethers. So just draw the rest of the molecule the same. With your two ethyl ethoxy groups attached where the oxygen was. So if we happen to have an alcohol attached to the same molecule, like we do over here, we're going to do that. And it's going to effectively stop at the hemiacetal because we don't have more alcohol around to react with it. So this is a ring closing reaction. We go from an aldehyde and an alcohol to an, your 
carbonyl oxygen becomes an alcohol and what was your alcohol becomes a cyclic ether. So in other words, we're just adding a bond between this oxygen and that carbon, which means the trickiest part of this is keeping track of how many pieces you have in your ring. And so I literally just write it out. The oxygen is part of your ring, so you have to count that. So one, two, three, four, five, six. The other oxygen is not part of your ring. It's attached to the ring. So it's going to be a hexagon. But where one of your oxygens or one of your carbons in cyclohexane is an oxygen instead. And then that oxygen that I threw, let me change the color on it. The H at the top, blue oxygen was the aldehyde oxygen, was the carbonyl oxygen. So by having your alcohol attack, the carbonyl carbon form a cyclic, cyclic ether and in doing so, convert that aldehyde to an OH. And so that's a hemiacetal and it stops there. And so this is why we talked about sugars last, last week. It's because this is, if you have a bunch of other OHs attached to the carbons in between, then this is a sugar. You have One, two, three, four, five. Actually, yes, probably. Actually, it's five carbons and five oxygens. This is ribose, or one of the stereoisomers of ribose, depending on the stereochemistry of all the blue OHs that are in the middle. So ribose. Um, is going to, to react to make that ring closure. It'll look a little bit different because ribose specifically acts, it's one of the, it's this, it's this OH that reacts, so you get a five-sided ring instead on DNA um, and RNA, but that's, that's where ribo in deoxyribonucleic acid comes from, is the ribose, and you get a five-sided ring. It's really a five-sided cyclic ether because you have this ring closure happening because ribose is a aldose normally. It's an aldehyde and it's an open chain form, but then it turns around and forms this closed chain form. In ribose, there's, for sugars, it gets tricky because you have multiple possible nucleophiles. So ribose, when it's in DNA and RNA, it makes a five-sided ring. It can make a six-sided ring as well. It's just not as common and doesn't show up in biochemical pathways as much. But glucose does the same thing. Glucose has a six-sided ring structure, but also a five-sided ring structure that can form. And, they, and it's just, we kind of ignore the ones that aren't part of the main pathways because they don't fit into the right functional groups, but they also exist. Um, they just look a little bit weird compared to what we're used to for glucose. So if you end up with like cyclic uh, hemiacetal, can you then use that like carbonyl? That would be the... That's how you start making polymers out of these, is you, is you basically take this cyclic, um, you wind up with the alcohol portion reacting with another one to start making, that's how you start making starches and cellulose and glycogen um, are all derivatives where you start from this form of a sugar and then just start building up longer and longer chains of it. And so you basically, your body just goes through and chops off one glucose molecule at a time to digest when it needs ATP. Except for cellulose, because we don't have the right binding sites in our, in our body, cellulose is the same same idea, 
as starch and glycogen, but it's attached at the at a specific carbon. I believe it's carbon four that's attached in our body doesn't have the ability, doesn't have an enzyme with the right active site to be able to chop up cellulose into individual, um, into individual glucose molecules. So cellulose has just as much energy as starch does, but we can't digest it, so it just passes through as fiber, um, which is why cellulose is a very good source of energy for a potential biofuel because you can just take that cellulose and break it up into something that yeast can digest. Then you can ferment it and you can have ethanol, um, which is you know, a, good, a good biofuel precursor. Anyway. All right, we're over. Um, so we'll start with these last two at the beginning of class on Thursday. And we will have lab later today. I don't know what that lab is though. So I'll post that later um, once, once I get in there and look at what we're, what we've got to work with. Oh yeah, we have to do more points too. Yeah. Last week, yeah. I haven't done one of the two. <laughs>